I am very excited about our speaker today. I, I'm reading his book right now. Uh, Mark Trainer was a Marine platoon leader, infantry platoon leader in Vietnam, uh, tip of the spear. And uh, his book is based on his experience there. Um, but then it goes beyond um, uh, the time in Vietnam. And the, the principal character of the book is, uh, is a Marine uh, infantry machine gunner um, who uh, lives through his tour, is wounded, is sent home. Um, and then he, he goes on into talking about the rest of this person's life. And, and it, the book hit me on a very personal level because it's, it's, uh, it's, so, it's such a familiar story uh, because he talks not only about Vietnam and, and, and what happened there, but, but then how that experience has uh, shaded uh, the, the life of the, uh, the individual that he's writing about. And it's, it's very similar. I think all of us can identify with that, you know, especially the, those of us that were, were platoon leaders over there and, and camped out. Uh, so uh, without, uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Dave Warville, who is a personal friend of the author, uh, Mark Trainer, and, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, about Mark and about the book. So David, you got it. I'll just uh, very briefly, uh, I've known Mark Trainer since we first met in August of 1968. We were newly minted second lieutenants in the Marine Corps reporting for active duty at the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. Surprising no one but us, our first living quarters as Marine officers were in luxurious World War II era Quonset huts. Upon graduation from the basic school on 31 December 1968, which was 52 years ago last week, Mark received orders to the 1st Marine Division in Vietnam as an infantry platoon commander. Mark's experience leading Marines in combat provided the inspiration for his novel, A Quiet Cadence. A Quiet Cadence has received high praise and endorsements from a number of America's respected military leaders, including Admiral Mike Mullen, General David Petraeus, and General Jim Mattis. In his comments about Mark's book, General Mattis says that a quiet cadence sets the standard for an authentic description of combat and what our infantry veterans carry with them when they return home. The last that I checked Amazon books, there were 90 reviews of quiet cadence with an average rating of 4.9 stars out of a possible five. I'm proud to introduce my old friend, Mark Trainer to the AVVBA. Mark. Thanks, Dave uh, and Skip and Vince. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm honored to uh, be able to talk with everybody today. What uh, Vince and Skip and I uh, thought might work would be for me to, uh, to read several excerpts from the book, uh, probably about 15, 18 minutes or so, and then uh, uh, talk a tiny bit and, and answer any questions that folks have. So. If anyone uh, gets terribly bored during my reading, um, wave your hands vigorously. I'll look up and uh, stop in the middle of the page. So this is uh, the beginning of a quiet cadence. Sometimes the ghosts talk to me still. 40 years ago, they came frequently. In my 30s and 40s and 50s, not very much. They visited some in recent years and mostly that's okay. The dream frightened me for a long time. I couldn't tell if my old friends accused me or wished me well. Sometimes they seem to look to me for answers I've never had. I searched for a long time for a way to make peace with them and what I'd lost. My best friend and my wife helped me with that. Corey lost a great deal more than I did in Vietnam, at least physically, yet helped me remember what was good. Patty lived with much of what I brought home and saved me more than once from the dark. I've spoken very little of my war and the turmoil that followed. And over the years, nearly no one has asked. Most men my age celebrate Woodstock and Haight-Ashbury, reminisce about sit-ins on campuses or protests in the streets. They still marvel at their luck in the draft or depending on their audience, boast of or bury the deferments they received. 
my decile of the 60s generation grows old, having said little to our children about times very different for us. Recently though, even us old guys sometimes hear, thanks for your service. Sort of faint echoes of the well-deserved cheers greeting our troops coming home from our most recent wars. My guess is they'll find it difficult too to grapple with the truths they've learned. We have more in common than they may know. I'd like my kids to understand the events that changed their old man forever when I wasn't much older than theirs are now. Sometimes I think they believe my memories of those charged days were surgically removed along with the bullet in my back. Not that I blame them. I haven't exactly encouraged questions about my war or its impact on me, but I remember it all, a gift and a curse. Remembrance across decades is like looking through a telescope. Sometimes people and events in the distance come into the sharpest focus of all. The pictures come to me in extraordinary detail, like photos my brain took but couldn't erase. Sometimes frayed at the edges with things in the middle I wish I'd never seen, though there are some photos I would not want to lose. I remember the odors, the heat and the wet, the exhaustion and fear. I can still taste the bite of gunpowder, the terrible ferric sweetness of blood. I can still hear the cacophonous noises, the voices, the argo, the silences. It's as though they're next to my ear. What a profane crass gang we were. I remember the pain and the joy when I returned to the world, the hopes and the nightmares, the shame of what I did to get my first job, the one I'll retire from soon. I remember the love. Patty thinks it's important that I tell the truth. She knows little of my story, but she's probably right. She's usually been. I think it's time I tried. I know that too many men grow old basking in selective memories of their youth, but I don't believe much in glory, though I wouldn't trade anything for my time in the Corps, unless it was to save the forever young men who march front and center in my sleep. That dream always begins in silence, an absolute vacuum of noise, then only a faint distant sound, the whoop whoop and thrum of an approaching medevac bird, quivering in the air, a muted tremor of cries, a shroud of gunpowder infused fog covers all. Then my old friends emerge from the swirling pall and walk toward me, their eyes never leaving my face. They step to a cadence I sometimes strain to hear. Lately, pious John's spoken for all six of them. Tell them now, Mick, he says, tell them the truth. This then is their story and mine. It begins on the day I saw the dead man above the trees. And then jumping ahead a bit, this is a, an excerpt from uh, one of the first firefights that uh, Marty is in. And uh, as, uh, as uh, Skip said earlier, Marty's a, a Marine machine gunner, an enlisted guy, a PFC. The Lieutenant brought the platoon online so we could bring all our firepower to bear to the front. We couldn't move fast in the muck, so we walked spread out in the open for what felt like a long time. Loud, sharp, crackling bursts of gunfire suddenly spewed from the tree line. Things happened so fast, they seemed to meld into one turbulent blur of noise and frenetic action and confusion, though later everything that happened next was embedded in my brain with stop frame slow motion clarity. John was several steps in front of me going for the dike his knees pumping like he was running the tires in football practice. He stopped suddenly and looked back. Come on, come on, he yelled, get up here with the ammo. I tried to run, I tried to lift my knees the way John did. Where did he get the strength? I took half a dozen steps in the calf deep muck then dropped the ammo can. I found it, pulled it out of the mud and struggled forward. At the dike, John was already firing. He turned and yelled again for the ammo. Standing beside him with bullets snapping around him, Corporal Harding screamed at his squad, get up to the dike, return fire, move, people move. I was 10 yards from the dike when a line of tracers from an MVA machine gun ripped past my head. Neon blue-green flashes like bright blobs of protoplasm at ear level, five or six inches from my face. I had the strongest, craziest sensation that I could just lift my hand, wave hi to John and the bullets would pass through my palm like a Sunday morning cartoon character trying to catch blurbs of bright colored light. In that split second of caricature clarity, it barely registered that dozens of bullets had just passed within inches of my face. 
I dropped down behind the dike next to John. The ammo can was coated with thick, foul-smelling mud. I tore it open and began to feed the coiled belt into, feed pall of, into the feed pall of the gun. Dear God, I prayed, don't let that mud cause a misfeed. We half knelt, half lay, bullets snapping above our heads. John raked the trees with a long, yammering blast. I lifted the belts up out of the can, let the rounds run across my palm, run smoothly down into the feed tray an inch above my hand. Burst after burst, tracers slashed streaking red fire from us into the tree line. Then the lieutenant was yelling for anyone without a real target to cease fire, and the platoon sergeant, and then the squad leaders took up the call, and John stopped firing, and then Geo, and up and down the dike, the firing became only sporadic. Whenever a Marine fired, a blast came back at us. Most of the enemy's bullets went above our heads. A few hit the dike, but no other Marines were hit. If there had been a lot of gooks there before, it seemed now as only two or three might be left. I wondered if they were covering for the others who'd run off, or maybe the others were dead or too badly wounded to fight. I glanced toward Cabot. I could only see his legs because the corpsman knelt over him now. I couldn't tell if he was dead or alive. Lieutenant Mangan took first squad down the dike to a stand of trees on the left. With a pop and a whoosh, a green cluster flare tore into the air. We blasted the tree line in front of the enveloping squad as the lieutenant and the Marines with him swept in from the left. Then John stopped shooting. There were three or four bursts of M16 fire inside the tree line, then all firing stopped. And suddenly there was a strange momentary silence as though I'd suddenly gone deaf. Two bodies lay sprawled just inside the tree line. Two more back in the trees. I joined Harding and Woody and looked down at the corpses. One had his face shot away, smashed teeth and jawbone and broken, leaking nose and sinus cavities. One eye bulging out as though ready to explode from its socket and blast through the air like a ghoul's golf ball. My stomach churned. We left the bodies where they lay. Bloated black and blue flies were already swarming on their wet parts. Lieutenant Mangan wasn't happy. He was pleased with the four kills, but he wanted more and had hoped we would capture an NVA alive so we could send him back to Intel. The rest of the platoon was happy. Four confirms and only Cavett hit and he'd be fine. That was a win. I felt damn good about the day. My first fight, I did okay. And to my way of thinking, the Marines had won by a mile. I thought then about the blue green blurbs that had flown past my face. There must have been a dozen or more tracers and there were eight or ten more bullets between one tracer round and the next. I marveled at that. Maybe a hundred or more machine gun bullets had torn within a few inches of my head and there must have been hundreds or thousands more bullets flying around me with all the firing that had gone on. And in the middle of it I'd had that insane notion that I could have let the tracers pass through my hand like cartoon lights. I was suddenly chilled by retroactive fear but then I felt happy. Life and luck couldn't be as random as they seemed, not after two close ones now. Somebody up there was looking out for me. If that gook gunner had sneezed or burped or flinched or otherwise jiggled the barrel of his machine gun, he would have blown my head off, but he didn't. For a while, I forgot about Havy and Delta and Jackson and Sturmer and Bast and the powerful feeling of being a combat Marine. Hot damn, McClure, I thought the luck of the Irish, you'll be just fine. My descent into hell began the next week. Then it goes on to another chapter. The earth belched a sharp roaring blast that evaporated every other noise and filled the air with filthy smoke and debris. The booby trap Corrigan trip blew off his foot and ripped the meat from above the severed ankle to 10 inches below his knee. When the acrid gray smoke cleared, I saw him writhing on his back near the front of the column. The bones in his legs stuck out like the bloody tines of a crushed tuning fork. He held his mangled stump, stump up in the air with one hand, clutched at the dirt with the other as if he were struggling to keep from being torn away from the earth. He began to scream, his shrieks climbing a hideous scale, breaking at the top, followed by a moaning gulp for air, then beginning again. They felt like molten tin rushing through my ears, filling my sinuses, making my teeth and cheekbones throb. I wanted to cover my ears, but couldn't in front of the others. I squeezed my eyes shut so hard my sockets throb. My chest and stomach burned inside. The two corpsmen tied off Corey's leg. 
They knelt beside him, knees dark with his blood, bloody hands moving fast with tourniquet and bandages. Checked his femoral arteries, his torso, his head and neck for other wounds. Harding cradled Corey's head in his lap and Sergeant Gillis tried to hold him steady while Mac hit him with morphine and ran an IV into his arm. The two docs said little as they worked. They'd performed that choreography together too many times. It seemed to take a long time before the morphine quelled Corey's screams. He lay motionless, his eyes partly open in a dull gawk, his normally taut face flaccid and deflated. The tip of his tongue inched out as though seeking comfort from his dirty straw mustache. Below his trousers, his pallid leg ended in blood-soaked bandages lying in coagulated maroon dirt. My stomach clenched at the stench of gunpowder charred meat. Corey murmured something as though he were trying to push unintelligible words into coherent sentences. It sounded like he was whispering, Mom. Even after the helicopter took him away, I could see Corey's truncated leg and tortured face smell the blood and burn meat. For, for the rest of that day and into that night, his scream seemed to linger in the air. When I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to block out their noise, I saw bloody jagged bones like snapped off pipe stems slathered with gore. The echo of that day stayed with me. Perhaps that's because that's when I began my descent toward a depth of depravity that appalls me now, the one that seemed common, nearly unremarkable nearly necessary in that violent world. We saw no enemy the day Corey lost his leg or for days after that. We searched the small villas we came across, used an interpreter to question the inhabitants, found nothing, learned nothing of use. John said the villagers had little choice. If the enemy thought they cooperated with us, they'd be killed. Or maybe they had taken sides already. We patrolled farther into the valley each day not knowing who was friend or foe and finding no one to pay back. I kept seeing Corrigan's bloody shattered stump, kept hearing his screams. And the, book, the book goes on for quite a while with various incidents uh, in Vietnam, both mostly in the bush, but also in the rear. And then Marty's wounded, he goes back to the States and uh, this is where he's headed home to where he lives just outside Baltimore. He's in the airport in Chicago. In O'Hare, I stood on a moving walkway headed toward the gate for my Baltimore flight. Despite the ache in my shoulder, I was in a great mood. Who cared if I was invisible? I was almost home. Besides, I'd never been on a moving walkway before. It was pretty cool. A trio of girls moved toward me on the other conveyor, except for uniformed nurses and the two gorgeous stews in their form-fitting uniforms on the plane from San Diego how long had it been since I'd laid eyes on a pretty girl? The three I spotted a ways down the belt looked about my age. As the walkways pulled us toward each other, they seemed like angels floating on an invisible cloud. Long, straight hair, two blonde, the one in the middle of brunette, laughing quietly among themselves. The brunette wore a mini skirt I swore wasn't much bigger than a belt. As they got closer, I saw all three were braless. God bless America, I thought, it is good to be home. One of the girls glanced at me, then said something to the others. I smiled happily at them. Oh yeah, McClure, it is so, so damn good to be home. As we drew abreast of each other, I was just about to say, good morning, ladies, when with drill team precision, all three flipped me the bird. Marty does get home, and this is uh, one of the scenes um, uh, from his home. Mom never asked me about the war, never uttered the word Vietnam in my presence the whole time I was home. She wouldn't watch any news about Vietnam, and if she were talking about something that occurred at home while I was in country, she'd refer to that time as while you were gone. The closest she ever got to mentioning the war was on the Saturday after I came home. I walked quietly into the kitchen after sleeping till nearly 11. Mom was bent over the counter, rolling out dough to bake me a blueberry pie. Good morning, I said, startling her. She spun to me, tears streaming down her cheeks. Mom, what's wrong? She put her arms around me, keeping her flower whitened hands in the air and laid her head on my chest, careful not to jostle my shoulder or arm. I was so worried I'd lose you, she whispered. Dad and I never talked about what I'd seen or done in Vietnam either. 
a few days after I came home. I was helping him look for something in the garage. We'd been chatting about nothing in particular when he said, Marty, do you want to talk about what Vietnam was like? Probably much more quickly than either of us expected, I replied, I'd rather not think about that right now if that's okay. That was the truth. I desperately didn't want to think about all I'd been through. What I didn't say though was that I couldn't escape all the pictures that hung on the walls of my mind like grotesque paintings that made terrible noises in my sleep. Dad's face showed concern and kindness. He'd lost weight too and I'd notice how tobacco stained his fingers were. Among the three of us, we went through four or five packs a day. Of course, he said, I understand. I'm pretty sure though it was a lot tougher than you let on your letters. So if it ever be helpful, just know I'm here to listen. I wish later that I'd talked with dad. He might have helped me deal with the loss of so many friends or make sense of what I'd done or become much sooner than I eventually did. It wasn't just dad, of course. I didn't want to talk to anyone about the war who hadn't been there. How often have I looked back over that period of my life and realized help was there if I'd only known how to ask. Marty then gets transferred for the rest of his time in the Marine Corps down to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. I hadn't been in North Carolina long when a storm roared up the New River and slammed into the barracks where I was asleep along with a dozen other Marines. Fierce, jagged flashes of light, the crash and roll of thunder. I hugged the polished linoleum deck, low crawled away from my bunk, frantically searched for my fighting hole in the dim light of the squad bay. The only saving grace in my embarrassment when I finally stood up was that I wasn't the only guy who had scrabbled like a crab on the floor. My dreams came in all shapes and sizes and relations to truth. Most times I couldn't point to any given event that triggered a nightmare, but it wasn't hard to figure out where they came from. Except for the ghost dream though, the friends I'd lost rarely appeared in any of them. Maybe that was because they were so often in my thoughts during the day. Why I'd lived when my friends had died haunted my dreams as well as my waking thoughts. Sometimes I dreamt of row upon row of body bags, like a black plastic version of the markers in Arlington. Some bags were packed full, others only in part. Some appeared to contain almost nothing at all. A solitary man in jungle utilities walked slowly as though examining them. He stopped, looked down, an empty body bag at his feet. The man was me. And then I'm jumping ahead uh, several years. This is um, shortly after the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington um, uh, was beginning to be built. And Marty has renewed his friendship with uh, the fellow Corrigan that lost his leg earlier. They run together on Sunday mornings and uh, sometimes they talk and they've had an ongoing argument about, uh, about the memorial. Marty says, you know, I've been home a long time. It's kind of like throwing yourself a graduation party a dozen years afterwards and you're on your way, big whoop. A lot of vets aren't on their way, Corey says. If we're honest, I doubt any of us have really come to grips with that war. The salute's going to be a way for people to say thanks for serving in a tough time. I thought about that and I thought about my conversation with Matt. For years being a vet, being a Vietnam vet was like carrying a virus people could, <clears throat> excuse me, people could immunize themselves against only by silence. No one wanted to be reminded of that war. In the past, if I mentioned I'd served in Vietnam, most people seemed uninterested or embarrassed or uneasy, as though that time in my life weren't something I should be talking about. So I didn't. And after a while, that became fine with me. And now I didn't need a parade and I sure as hell didn't need to go to Washington to remember all the friends I'd lost for no good reason that I could fathom. With all the news about the wall of vets groups around the country gearing up to travel to the salute, the ghosts were coming to see me a lot. He talks again with Corey a little bit later on. He says, neither one of us spoke for a minute and then I went on more quietly, less frantically. For 10 years, we fight a war and guys die every day. We're fighting global communism. We're fighting to keep the honor 
to keep the people of South Vietnam free. We're fighting for peace with honor. We're fighting for this, we're fighting for that. We're fighting over the size and shape of the fucking table at the Paris peace talks. And one day the president comes on television and says, I declare the war over. We've achieved peace with honor. Jesus H Christ. I looked at the other cars near us. No one was around, it wouldn't have made any difference. I barreled on. And then the tanks roll south and we watch all those people we claimed were our friends <clears throat> claw at the embassy gates, then spend the next 10 years in concentration camps if they weren't shot. Is that all it takes? 58,000 guys in body bags and then people in pinstripe suits say, ah, fuck it, we don't need this war. Let's let them have the goddamn place and we just call it quits. I press my fingertips hard into my throbbing shoulder. Jesus Christ, Corey, why wasn't it over be before then? If it was gonna be over at all before anything really got done. Did we have a goddamn quota before Johnson or Nixon or somebody would finally say, okay, that's enough guys in bags. Let's just give up and go home. All those kids killed, my good God. Why couldn't Corey understand? He left his own goddamn leg in the dirt. He'd known those same guys I tried to avoid in my dreams. Didn't he ache for them just like I did? I took a deep gasping breath. I looked over at Corey and then in a very quiet voice said, Corey, I'm sorry, I don't mean to yell at you, but what the hell do I need to go to the, Viet <coughs> excuse me, the Vietnam Memorial for? What is there there that would change things that would make the pain worthwhile? During my entire outburst, Corey had just sat, sat staring at the ground, rubbing the red tip of his stump with a big chunk of ice. He stopped rubbing his leg, dropped the ice in the dirt beside the truck and looked at me. It's the guys, Marty, he said. They did their best and we love them. That's what counts in the end. No matter the outcome of what of that war was, they mattered to us. Corey looked away as though he could see something off in the distance again. He went on quietly. We may each have had different reasons for serving, but at the end of the day, what we fought for was each other. We were part of a brotherhood. We still are. It was one that believed in courage, courage and discipline and loyalty. No matter what we thought or think now of our political leaders or their decisions then, we believed in America and in each other. That was a cadence we all marched to, Marty. You, me, all the guys with their names on the wall, even the kids who serve now. And something inside us is going to march to that quiet cadence for the rest of our lives. And then the book goes on from there. So that's all I'll read. And if anybody is awake, um, uh, Vince and uh, uh, Skip, if it's okay, I'll just uh, talk for one more minute and um, about uh, uh, the reason that I, I wrote the book. Um, I kind of played at it over close to 30 years and then around 19 or 2014, uh, I mean, I decided I was just going to sit down and do it. And the reason I did it like this in kind of two parts was I wasn't aware of any other novel that there are a lot of good uh, war novels out there and Vietnam novels, but I wasn't aware of any that combined a really authentic description of what we ask of our young kids in combat and then what it's like for them after they come home. Um, I had uh, not only spent five years in the Marines, but then um, in, the, uh, in the 80s had done a bunch of work with a group called the Vietnam Veterans Leadership Program. There was a group of us that had gotten on with life and been relatively successful. And um, we tried to help others throughout the country uh, who hadn't done as well. And I realized then and, and still believe today that there's been a, a dialogue in the press that has portrayed vets as uh, uh, not in the positive light that, um, uh, that um, I believe that we all ought to be portrayed in. Uh, and I don't believe that everybody's got problems that's been in combat. I think that everybody that's been in combat uh, um, undoubtedly has uh, some post-traumatic stress, but I don't think it necessarily rises to the level of a, of a disorder. You just can't be, you can't go through that kind of thing without, without experiencing something afterwards and having doubts and questions in my judgment. 
And so I wrote the book in the two parts because I wanted to show, and as you could, you got a very small glimpse of how graphic the first section of the book can be. And it is, there are parts of it that frankly are gonna be very tough for people to read. Um, but I did it like that because I wanted people who didn't know what the, actual, the actuality of combat was to when they got to the second half of the book and realized how Marty struggled with his memories and the ghosts that came to him and what he thought about the war or didn't think about it. Um, I wanted them to truly understand if they could uh, what had gone on in his head or what he had lived through and, and what he had seen. So I tried to combine the two and, um, and I also tried to write it in a way that was kind of universal. And I have to say that uh, one of the neatest things, I've gotten a lot of notes from Vietnam vets that uh, have appreciated the book, but, and I greatly am honored by that, but something that's really meant a great deal to me too, is that uh, uh, um, I've gotten any number of notes from younger guys, uh, not like us old codgers who uh, uh, served in Afghanistan or uh, Iraq. And invariably they, they thank me for writing the book and say, uh, you know, that book was really about us, um, not just not just you old guys. So uh, <clears throat> so I think that's been kind of a neat thing. The book is actually being used in a number of vet centers around the country, uh, both guy, for guys from our era and uh, younger guys and the people at the vet centers are finding it helpful. So it's very encouraging to hear you actually say that you've talked to people about that. Skip, are you okay to speak now? Yeah, I think so. I'm sorry. I, you know, uh, funny how those things will creep up on you sometimes. Um, You're right, brother. I, uh, uh, you know, the only the only medal that my mother knew what was was a Purple Heart, and and when I got wounded, I didn't I didn't tell I didn't tell anybody that because I wasn't hit that bad. Um, so I didn't tell anybody about it, but my mom just had a fit when I got home, you know, they came to the airport to get me and, and, uh, she had a fit. So, um, any other questions? Um, the, the book obviously is available on Amazon and, and I'm sure at Barnes and Noble and, and other places. And uh, uh, it, is, it is just an excellent book, uh, especially from the perspective of, of veterans like us that are at our stage in life and are still uh, dealing with um, with some ghosts um, and um, it, you know, it really, it really is a good read and it's really, it's a very cathartic read. So uh, I would, I would heartily endorse that. Um, and Mark, thank you so much. Is that possible for us to uh, buy one directly from you and have you sign it, Mark? Sure, I can make that happen. Okay, great. Hey, good, good. Yeah, I'm not, sure the one I'm reading is on Kindle, but I I want to get a hard copy. So, uh, and and let me know uh, when you email me your snail mail address, what the what the cost is and everything, and we'll put it out to the troops. Okay, thanks, Skip. I'll do that. And if the book that you're talking about sending me is, I'm ready to talk. I want to compliment you and. Uh, say thanks to Vince. He sent me a copy. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Time back and I have read major chunks of it. And uh, it's a, it's a great work. Um, you know, really meaningful with so many people talking about so many different aspects of their service. Skip, you did a wonderful job emceeing this portion. I just want to add for a few seconds. I think the thing that made, made this so cathartic for all of us is that Sue Verhoff is on the line. Bob Babcock is on the line. So Sue holds our hand and holds our heart when we go to the Atlanta Veterans History Project and we tell our story. So 
although although Mark's book is not autobiographical, it is somewhat autobiographical. I heard echoes of my story and other stories as I listened to Mark. Then Bob Babcock, who of course is the publisher and the and the heart and soul of I'm Ready to Talk, again, I, I heard echoes of our story. So uh, great selection, Skip, of, of Mark as a speaker. And I know we have to move on with the agenda. Mark, you were a big hit. And as everyone said, we're going to put our money where our mouth is if you'll let us become owners of, of autographed issues of your book. I'd be uh, privileged to do that. Thanks, Vince. And it's been an honor to uh, talk with all of you today. But only if you but only if you join ABBA. Sorry, I just slipped that in there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and VEO. <laughs> hey, hey, if I may jump in once again, which you guys know I always do, uh, what John just said. Uh, on the call today, we have... Uh, two guys that I served with in Vietnam. One of them is Jim Stapleton, who's now in Florida, and we all know him. But Russ Zink asked me about this, and I said, get on with us. He's out in California, and I guess it's about 9 o'clock out there, and I saw he's here. So, Russ, you can join, and Jim already has, and we all should invite, as long as we got Zoom going, let's invite people to Join us. You don't have to be in Atlanta. Good, good point. Good point, Bob. And in fact, um, uh, we we are strongly considering leaving the Zoom capability up once we start meeting eyeball to eyeball again, uh, just because it does open up this group to so many different people in so many different places and and. Uh, you know, being a Vietnam vet is a, um, you know, we paid a, a pretty good price to be able to call ourselves that. And, uh, and it's certainly, uh, it, it's, it's good for all of us to be able to get together with people that understand us. Um, it's like, uh, well, it's like Mark was saying in his book, young Marine talking to his dad and thinking, you know, I, I really don't want to talk about this except to somebody that would know what the heck I was talking about. Without beating that horse to death, for the next two years, if I can speak to myself, we will be continuing with a Zoom type virtual meeting, regardless whether we're meeting face to face or not. And after I'm no longer the board chair, somebody else can make that decision. But as the, as the board, I, I intend for us to vote on that actually today, because I, I, we've been talking about this for months and there's no question in my mind that it's something we need to do. So we, I'm committed to, for us to do that.